Hi all. I'm going to continue my coverage of the, the South End just gone. Um, so, to recap, I'm um, missing the last round, but um, instead I'm going to do some video annotations early while, while the games are still fresh in my mind. I want this game uh, now to be my win against FM Dave Ledger, who I also beat last year, so I think he's getting sick of me now. I was black in this game. I want to also, whilst um, covering the, the key points of this game, look at a broader issue. And I'll call that uh, Dangerous Weapons versus Cute Fluffy Ideas. It's been bugging me a long time. Things like um, Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster, talking about candidate moves. Things like Silman talking about imbalances. Um, Nimzovich talking about you know various things. And... You know, are they dangerous weapons or are they cute, fluffy ideas? Well, in the case of um, Nimzovich, I have mentioned in previous videos that a lot of his stuff was actually based on the art of war. You know, and also you have war concepts like blockade. You know, it's literally used in war. Um, you know, undermining, you know, outposts. You know, these are all war terms. So are they dangerous weapons or cute, fluffy ideas? Have a think about that and what you're fed. And here's another one, imbalances. That's cute, isn't it? You can look at a position and you can document all the imbalances. Great. So you can say the opponent has a space advantage and you have the two bishops. That's nice. Well done on documenting something. Well done on picking up a cute, fluffy idea. Now, when you go and play chess games against really strong opponents, would you like to have cute, fluffy ideas or dangerous weapons? Pause for thought there, um, because also, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot myself about imbalances. Really, I, I think, you know, for me personally, I, if I'm going to um, have positional factors, I want, you know, to positionally crush the opponent, to strategically crush them. You know, I don't really want them to have any good stuff in the position, but you have to respect the opponent's activity and you have to give them sometimes um, assets in the position in order to, for, you, for you to have other aspect, assets which might be different, hence the imbalance. But I like to think of it more, you know, as you get these strategic trump cards. Yeah, if you have a trump card, you're giving the opponent, say, extra space, but you get the two bishops which you judge in that position to be a trumping card over the opponent's card. So, you know, you really, you're really you trying to win against your opponent, so you need to have dangerous weapons and not cute ideas. So here, I created some imbalances straight away against Dave Ledger by playing quite a sharp line in the French defence. So after d4, d5, he played knight c3, and after knight f6, he played bishop g5. And actually, both the games yesterday against the two FMs, they both played this instead of e5. I don't know what um, they dislike about e5. You know, black, you know, maybe struggles to get some queenside counterplay. But maybe, you know, they don't like the undermining c5 in principle. So they played bishop g5, uh, but I'll cover the other game later. Let's just stick with this one for the moment. So d takes e4, and after the knight takes e4, I played bishop e7. So this was played against Gary Quillen. Um, against me on the white side years ago and I took it up after that because I thought black gets some interesting dynamic play here. So after bishop takes f6, g takes f6, what are the imbalances? White has the superior pawn structure, obviously, because black has the double pawns. But black has the dark squared bishop and potential to use the g file. So are we going to treat this as a dangerous weapon or um, a cute fluffy idea? Well, th there is the imbalances, but will, will this strategic um, asset outweigh bl White's kind of superior asset in terms of the better pawn structure? In this game, the, the, it's almost as evidence that it's, it's good for, for black, but in the next game, um, the counter-arguments are seen. White played knight f3, and I played b6, and now Dave Ledger, he threw in a check, and after c6... He played bishop c4. So it seems, you know, white's wasted the tempo. Why throw in this check? Well, one of the key ideas is to disrupt this bishop. When it goes to b7, it won't be eyeing e4, which might be tactically useful. So if black ever wants to play c5 later, it's going to, um, you know, be annoying. Um, but, you know, to try and get control of e4. 
So, I played bishop b7, and after queen e2, now I played knight d7. So I'm preparing to castle queenside, with queen c7, and castles queenside. He castled queenside as well. Note now that it's actually, in my view, having played both games yesterday, it's safer for black to follow where white castles. Because if white had castled kingside, then a4, a5 would be more dangerous, because this rook would be on a1, still on a1, supporting um, a4, a5, and potentially a6, hemming in this bishop. So here it's perfectly okay, it seems to me at the moment, um, to play queen c7 and aim to castle queen side to follow where white has castled. So rook h e1, now king b8. So I'm further tucking away my king. Uh, you know, there's potential um, tactics on the horizon with bishop e6 if black's not careful. So tucking the king a bit further is um, you know, adding to the safety of black's position. After knight c3, now this was an interesting move. I thought there was a subtle quirkiness about white setup here and although I'm restricted you know in playing either a6 or c5 or a6 because the the, um, the bishop and queen are stopping a6 and c5 because of either d5 or knight b5 um, there is another potential uh, strategic breakout idea involving First b5, and then a6, because then I might be able to play c5. So I use that, but also I add to the mix another idea. So first I play b5, I chase the bishop back, and now I play bishop b4. So we have this quite nasty pin. Very useful, threatening immediately to double pawns. And it's sort of awkward, if white plays queen d3 casually, then maybe um, queen a5. Actually, Ribka gives knight c5 here, of course. That's, of course, now, looking at it, because the rook is eyeing the queen. But say, um, okay, queen e3. Queen e3. I was looking at queen a5s. But maybe this is okay for white. It seems a bit awkward if white has to play rook d3, though. So, basically, I was kind of happy to have this bishop b4. He plays rook d3. And I think, you know, black's almost, you know, equal. Actually, Ribka gives a slight advantage now to black. I play rook hg8. And the idea, if I slightly weaken uh, white's pawns by, by provoking g3, then if I do eventually play c5, this bishop will have a nice target on f3 and the diagonal in general. So it's nice to prompt white to play g3. And now I play a6. So I'm preparing now c5. So I seem to be brewing a bigger positional advantage now. And after a3, I, I maintain my pin by playing bishop a5. I'm also wary. I don't want knight e4 to c5 to happen. 